And welcome to your LSU football fix. I'm Preston Guy, staff writer at TigerBait.com. Join with me as always is my loyal co-host, Zach Nagy, writer at uh, LSU Country on SportsIllustrated.com. Tonight's show, we're going to be bringing the one and only, you know him, you love him, Matt Muscona. We're going to talk some LSU football tonight as LSU dismantles Grambling 72-10. to 10. But there's, of course, some things not to like in that game, especially on the heels of Florida State where you gave up 45 points. Those first three drives were pretty ugly. After we talked to Matt, I have charted the 26 plays that were just so awful where you gave up 237 yards against Grambling. And we're going we're gonna to go into that and figure out what went wrong, what went right, all the good stuff, and then we'll get to try to get to some more of your comments. But Without further ado, here he is, Matt Muscona of 104.5 ESPN. What's going on, Matt? What up, gents? Good evening, Hi. man. It's way, 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 way better to uh, to wake up on a Monday after the Tigers and the Saints both win. So t- today, today the the energy, the animus was just ratcheted down about ten thousand notches from last week. You're not lying. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But you know what? The views, if they lost to Grambling, would be incredible. But <laughs> <laughs> the views, they burn the place down, man. None of us would exist anymore if they lost to Grambling. Oh my god. You know, I, I figured we all survived the Troy loss. But anyways, um, so obviously not great energy coming off Florida State. You were probably one of the highest people on this uh football team. I believe did you pick them to win the national championship? I did. did I yeah, get that I right? Did. All right, so he, here's my question. We'll just go meta concept, and we'll see where it dives us in more granular. Um, d- is your faith in this team, is is it bothered based on what you've seen over the last two weeks, or do you just think Florida State's a good team and this team still has every opportunity to play for, I mean, basically everything at this point? So I – so just for a little context, I arrived at the at picking them to win the national championship based on a few criteria. Number one, I thought that this is the worst quarterback year in the SEC since 2014. And if y'all remember, 2013 was so good. Manziel, yeah. Mettenberger, McCarron, yeah. Murray, Connor, Shaw, like everybody had dudes. And then in 2014, they were all gone, and it was like. Bo Wallace and Brandon Harris and Anthony Jennings. I mean, it was a it was awful. And as a result of that, I figured, look, LSU has the best quarterback returning in the league, you know, a fifth year starter. And a not saying that Jaden is Joe Burrow or anything close to it, just that in a in a weakened quarterback year in this league, he's the best. And I loved the schedule. I loved getting Auburn, A&M, Florida at home, Tennessee rotating off, Missouri rotating on. Yes, you have to go to Bama, but LSU's won more in Tuscaloosa in the last 50 years, and they haven't Baton Rouge. So I I like the setup and I figured generally, look, man, every four years we've had this cycle where LSU's gotten hot and gone and won or played for the national championship. So, yeah, so I, I mean, look, so I, I, I sort of bet on the come a little bit with them. Long way to, to get to the answer to your question. Um I, we all knew the secondary wasn't going to be great. And the week before the, the Florida state game, one of the the things that I went and dug up and, and talked about on my show was I looked at national champions in the college football playoff era and where their past defense is finished. And I was surprised gen, gen, uh, genuinely like 2020 Bama was 71st in the country in past defense A 2019 LSU was 59th. That was with Stingley yeah. and Fulton. I get it. Point being, like, you don't have to have a great pass defense. You got to score. Stage. Yeah. You got to be able to score. Georgia yeah. last year was 52nd in the country in pass defense. Really? Yeah. So, That's wild. So, I guess, so it is my faith shaken? Like, how hard not to be, right? I mean, they, they, they were awful. I mean, the secondary yeah. was awful, um, worse than I thought it was going to be. But I also look at what LSU did a year ago how they just continued improving as the season went along. And I think this team has that runway. Because, guys, I don't know if you agree with this, but, I mean, I think they're going to go to Bama 7-1. and one. I don't see a game in the next six where I go, yeah, they they can't win that one. 
So, so I, even even with morning coffee, bourbon in in Starkville, eleven a.m. kickoff, you don't think that's trippy, man? I have either of y'all had a chance to talk to Zach Arnett at all? No, no. Um, he so I, so I picked State last in the West, and I and I know State fans get really upset about this because yeah, they always get picked to finish last, they never finish last, and, and I'm not one of those that always just like default state to last but guys i'm just i do not think zach arnett is an impressive guy number one number two um how in the world like what an impossible task to replace mike leach not just the same thing like that right. but when i watched him during sec media days it was kind of like I, it's not like i wasn't impressed but i didn't think he was horrible per se um not impressive is tough though like what do you mean I don't think – so I, I had a chance to, to sit one-on-one with him at, at many right. days. And usually with head coaches, guys – and maybe this is just a very surface-level thing, but usually with head coaches at this level, there's a degree of of alpha male where you understand why they got that job. Like you know what I mean? Like, figure. Yeah, like I, yeah. I get why people follow you. I, you know, And there's – it's maybe guys, maybe honestly it was also a, a piece where I was – just a little jaded from the fact that you know LSU interviewed Arnett f- to be the DC after um, Aranda left, and I, I was told by several people that read the room that it was like the worst interview. I, so I didn't get the job. So it was a terrible interview. So maybe, so again, maybe with that as my background understanding, but I also look at state, man, I go look Mike Leach guys, Mike Leach won in Waco te- or in, in Lubbock, Texas, Pullman, Washington, Starkville, Mississippi. There's never been a coach in history that did more with less resources than Mike Leach and his offense was a one-off. So now you're trying to change from the air raid to more conventional style. You got Will Rogers, who's played his whole career in that offense. Now you're switching it on him. I don't think the head coach is impressive. So I'm not, that's why LSU is a 10 point favorite. Like i could, look, is LSU capable of losing? Yes. I think we saw that against Florida State. Yeah. They're capable of losing to anybody. I also think they're capable of winning every game on their schedule remaining. And I, I think they'll go go to Starkville and win. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. You know, I, I, I actually listened to Zach Arnett at SEC Media Days, and he actually kind of impressed me a little bit because the buzz was out of Starkville. Oh, is Will Rogers going to be able to take a snap from under center? And he's like, <laughs> he basically did an error. I think it was fine bomb. He did it. Maybe, maybe it was even yours. And he was like, um, he's like, guys, it's it's 2023. We're, we're not doing that much under center. It ain't going to be that different. And my thought was. Okay, well, he probably has the playbook from Mark, Mike Leach, and he's going to call plays. But then I'm seeing what's actually going down. You have Will Rogers, who's in his 53rd college season, who's thrown for probably close to a billion yards, and he's thrown 46 times in two games. That's crazy. I mean, he's got 11,000 career passing yards. Like he's pacing to break Aaron Murray's all of yeah. Aaron Murray's career passing records, and. Yeah. He may not get. He may not get there with the way that's unbelievable. Is thing it's just it like to, just like flipping the script on everything and kind of switching it up on him is kind of you know interesting to see. But I, I mean, I think I think LSU goes up there and handles business. I, yeah, I, I would. I, 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 I would compare it, guys. Like I don't know if y'all agree with this, but it's almost like when Paul Johnson left Georgia Tech and he had run the option there for ten years or whatever it was. Like when you've recruited to a certain thing for a length of time and then you completely do a one eighty. It's, I think it's reasonable to expect it to take time for that to take. I, like, I don't know if y'all remember this, but like in 2003 or four, when Bill Callahan went to Nebraska. Like, Nebraska for 100 years was always like triple option. I mean, it's what they did. And then Bill Callahan came in from the Raiders and was like, we're going to spread it out and throw. We're going to modernize this thing. And man, they have not recovered since. Yeah. Like, they just mm-hmm. have never recovered. So, I, I think whenever there's a dramatic sea chain and uh, change in what you're doing schematically, there's there's just a na- I think a natural there's going to be a natural period of, you know a lag period where it's going to take to build that up. Uh, I don't know. I just I, I'm maybe state surprises me. I am just not a believer in in Zach Arnett or this team this year. 
Me neither. And I'm not a big believer of their talent level either. Go look at the recruiting rankings. You can see, you know, they're they're toward the bottom of the pack in the SEC. Yes, they brought back 20 starters. And that always, you know, always one of my buddies has a radio show in Tuscaloosa. He brings me on and they always ask me. And I'm like, all right, I, I you know, it seems like every year t- t- Mississippi State brings back 20 starters. And they always end up going seven and five or whatever. You know, I'm just never too impressed. I do think LSU gets off to a slow start, though. You know, we know how these 11 a.m. kickoffs go, man. And there's just it's something genetically wired in these Louisiana boys. They don't wake up 11 a.m. on Saturdays. That's just not how it works. But I think LSU takes care of business. I think Vegas got it right. Ten points. That sounds fair. I would like to see a a relatively stress free day. Um, I'm with you on the 11 a.m. start. Brian Kelly actually talked a lot about that today. Like even unprompted, he brought up the 11 a.m. several times. So. Then I actually asked him if he was planning on doing anything different. Because remember, last year we saw LSU play two 11 a.m. games. Yeah. Uh, both were forgettable, uh, Tennessee and Arkansas. Now, you managed to squeak out the win against Arkansas, but Tennessee was a disaster, and you might not have beaten Arkansas without Harold Perkins. But um, I, he said, look, I, I mean, they're going to do a team meal at 7 o'clock or 7.20. they got an hour-long bus ride. You know, you, you got to get the mojo working early to be ready to roll uh, when they tee it up and kick it off. But – the one benefit, guys, of the 11 a.m. kickoff is it means we're done with post game early. So, like, mm-hmm. I can go have a date night with my <laughs> wife and your go, go to dinner. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> watch a football night. game. Yeah, it's yeah. always a negotiation for one of those games. Like, do you, do you take out the wife or do you get to watch more football that you usually wouldn't? Yeah. You know, one, one of the frustrating parts about getting into this industry professionally covering the team is like, I don't get to watch other teams nearly as much as I used to because you just flip the channel or whatever. No, you have to be into yeah. it, man. You're writing a I story. Know. You're looking at live stats. Hey, Drew, what's up, buddy? I t- his name is Preston. Say hi, Preston. Hi, Preston. And he's Zach. Can you say hi, Zach? Hi. What's up, little man? Oh, okay. Bro, Preston, I told you this was an absolute He literally texted certainty. me about this. I, I said, look, <laughs> I told bring you it on, man. Add character to the show. I said 100% my kid is going to walk in here and interrupt. I love Sometimes my wife baby bombs me in the middle of a show, and I'm just like, all right, I got you know, <laughs> it. That's what it is, arm, Guys, we're rolling with it. But as long as Drew's rolling with the Tigers, he can roll on this show all he wants. Can yeah. you say go Tigers? Go Tigers. Good job. All right, go see Mommy. All right, go see Mommy. Love it. Good job, man. <laughs> Brian, um, I told you, dude, there was a 100% certainty that was happening. <laughs> hey, man, kids are great. Got to love them. Yeah. Um. So LSU's got a number of issues that it ha- it's facing as a team, right? And what I'm trying to go is figure out: are these correctable issues? Are they like you know, are they X's and O's or Jimmy's and Joe's? Because you fix some X's and O's. Jimmy's and Joe's are, are kind of tough to find. I mean, um, and, and you know, and then if it's the players making a problem, can you coach it out of them? Fortunately, a lot of problems I'm finding are coachable. Like, like okay, Harold Perkins maybe missing on a coverage. Like, okay, I think he's got the talent to, yeah. to learn to cover that ball a little bit better. Um, wh- just broadly, what is what is the biggest issue you've seen with this team? And do you have faith that they're going to straighten it out? Well, I think we all – I mean, it's the same for all of us, right? I mean, it's got to yeah. be the secondary. It was the biggest question going into the season. Yeah. And it's shown through two games. All those concerns were were validated. I mean, our guys, like usually, like usually, when like, and it was different with like with Les and with Ed. They didn't allow us as much access as Brian has, which is great. I'm super grateful for it. But even like the little bit that we got to see before, you could always tell like the defense was ahead of the offense in camp. And it makes mm-hmm. sense, right? Like. Line up, see ball, hit ball. The offense is timing and rhythm and all that sort of stuff. Um, it was stunning how how much early in this camp the offense was dusting this defense. But I feel like that has to do a lot with just all the returning talent on offense too. Like, yes, it is such a fresh faced defense, and you got to gain continuity at some point. But to to add on to what you were saying, it was mind boggling just watching that offense tear up the defense just day in and day out. I mean, Zach, it was every day. It was every drill. I mean, now, hold with that first day in one on ones, and just yes, on that first day, just everybody was just defeated, now, just thinking that secondary is in trouble. I'm gonna give the defense in fall camp this when they finally went 11 on 11, and you saw that defensive line go, that offense came back down to earth. They were good. I mean, we saw Caleb Jackson just went hog wild. Yeah. Um, but I mean, uh, Jaden Daniels was six for 11 for like 
59 yards. Uh, the thing is, like, when you start to put pressure on the quarterback, like, obviously it's going to make, like, you know, mm-hmm. cornerback and wide receiver drills more difficult because seven on seven, you can only do so much. Like, no pass rush, no nothing, which was kind of reason the reason why the cornerbacks got so exploited. But, I mean, yeah, it, it was just ugly from the jump in fall camp. And, Matt, to what you were saying, you know, it was all validated these first two weeks for sure. Yeah, so, I, you know, I, I think the question, can they fix it? I mean, to, you can get, you can always get better, but you know, do I think that there's going to be a point where the secondary is a strength on this team? Absolutely not. But you know, I, I think for me, I'm going to be really interested to see who steps up and ends up winning the cornerback job opposite Zai Alexander. Like he's pretty firmly entrenched. You know, he's going to be the the guy that I. So I tend to lean on. Like I never played cornerback. I can't like tell you that I'm watching going, oh look, he flipped his hip and he undercut a route and got to the show. Like I am not that guy, right? Hey man, I'm I, right there with you, dog. So so I, I mean I try to lean on either people I know within the program to kind of tell me what's going on, or people who I trust who have watched this team in a higher acumen. Like I'll talk to like I had Corey Webster on the show a couple of weeks ago and asked him after he went to practice or, you know, like Ryan Clark's good enough to come on with us during the week. So I can lean on those guys. And man, like the, the one that I think I'm most interested in is Ashton Stamps it because has they, they really like him a lot. Oh yeah. And typically if the, if the coaches are telling you that they like a player, it's because they see something that maybe we don't. And I think, to all of our faults, sometimes we get caught up in star ratings and star rankings, and you just assume. Like, I know it's the big thing with Denver Harris, and he's a great athlete, but the thing that I was told all along with Denver Harris is, and Brian Kelly said it today, point blank, he said he plays press man. He's press man. You get off the bus, he's press man. Like, that's something I was told back in spring is this is a guy whose whole life has been more athletic than everybody, so he's been able just to play man coverage. Well, at this level, you got to play zone concepts and a lot of different things that he's got to learn. So – you know, if that learning curve, you know, gets accelerated, then great. But that would be awesome. But I think the guy who they feel like is ready to be on the field is is Stamps. So, I mean, guys, we've already seen, and they started say drawing against Florida State. They quickly put Chestnut in. We saw how that went. And then, you know, we got to see Denver Harris start against Scrambling, and we saw some of Stamps as well. I mean, they're trying. You know what I mean, like they are trying. Well, you know what stood out about Stamps to me? They had him on the field till the bitter end. I mean, mo- you were mostly down to your threes and and guys who hadn't really played much at all, and they they said no, we need Ashton Stamps getting every freaking rep we can get, and I think that speaks volumes. I think the fact that Matt House and his, you know, in the middle of of fall camp, we're asking about corners and stuff like that. It, one of the first names he's bringing up is Ashton Stamps, how highly yeah. he's he's talking of him. So I, I think it is a matter of time before Ashton Stamps emerges. I think Denver Harris is another guy who's who's coming on. He, he, he The touchdown he gave up, that's something we'll talk more in depth, but he had great coverage on that. He yeah. just couldn't find the ball, and that's that's been a problem with the DBs this year is just not finding the ball. They're there on coverage to just, for some reason, the they can't they can't get it. And I don't know enough about DB to understand the, what goes into the that. Six, but, the six four kid in yeah. red uh, week one had something to do with that too. Like yeah, when, well, when Keon Coleman was high point balls over Chestnut and Major Burns. Like, yeah, he what a freak! Special. He's really good. What a freak, man. I, you love seeing the Louisiana receivers go elsewhere and carve you up, Devontae Smith and and plenty of others. But, you know, I guess I guess LSU gets its fair share of receivers uh, in state. I'll say this about the defensive backfield. The one thing that disappointed me is seeing your, your senior safeties who are supposed to be the strength of your team not making tackles. Like, like um, uh, what's his name? Major Burns. Okay, he's had a pretty rough season so far. You know, we saw him get burned in, in Florida State again. 6'4 freak, you understand why it happened. But in the first three drives against Grambling, he had four missed tackles on three drives. And it's just he's running downfield like a headhunter trying to knock the crap out of somebody. And it's like you can't do that when they already have the ball. They'll make one step and you're flying past them. you got to break down and chop down and tackle. And that's the frustrating part is when you've got senior leaders who were supposed to be the strength of your defensive backfield and they're just the basic plays. They're just not – 
making. So uh, I, I do hope that I, the, that that's an addressable issue. That's where my hope comes from. Is it doesn't take long to get a guy learn how to come down, chop your feet, and wrap up and tackle. I mean, I, and I I think I think Greg Brooks has been good. Um, he's their best defensive back. He's yeah. under he's undersized, but he's their best guy back there. And the other you know, interesting thing about Major is, I I would say his best attributes are his physicality. Like I would like to see him play more box safety and mm-hmm. help and run support and all. But the problem with that is number one, he's been he's been injury prone in his career. Unfortunately, not not of no fault of his own. He just has, mm-hmm. and um, and he is a liability on the back end in coverage. You know, but I. You, know, you realize how valuable someone like Jay Ward was last year, who could play boundary corner, who could play nickel, who could go play in the deep safety. Like he was such a a versatile piece for that defense. And we probably that's we probably just didn't talk enough about Jay Ward, how how good, how really good of a football player he was. Yeah. No, no, no doubt in that. And, and the, the real problem with Major Burns is I don't think you have a, a true free safety at this point, because you're not putting Greg Brooks at free. He, he's going to be your strong. Yeah. Uh, and, and if it's not Major Burns back there, who do you put Andre Sam? Well, they've got Andre Sam running all over the field right now. So I, I don't know that you have a true free safety that you trust at this point. And that's like when you illustrate what is at its crux the problem that Brian Kelly needs to address. We're talking about your best cornerback is a transfer from Southeastern. The safety we're asking if he's the solution is a transfer from Marshall. Deuce Chestnuts from Syracuse. You know, I mean, and it's not to to necessarily diminish those places, but generally, like, I mean, this is LSU, man. It's it's DBU. It's it's a place that's been a breeding ground for freak shows for two decades. And the fact that you're reliant, and I understand why it happened. I mean, you know, Ogeron got fired, Ricks and McLaughlin transferred out, you, it, and you were behind the eight ball. You had to go recruit you know, portal heavy last year. I, I get, I get it. And it's going to take time to, to build it back up. But, man, I just – I don't know that that answer right now is on the roster. You know, there's – I'm interested in JV and Toviano. I'm surprised we haven't seen Shocked. him more. Um, because in spring, they loved him in spring. And something oh. somewhere there was a disconnect where they just haven't found the most comfortable spot for him that makes sense to, to warrant get him, getting him on the field. I'd love to see him at free because, I mean, he's got that history of playing corner. And so, you know, he's got the cover skills. He's got long arms. I'd love to see him work at free, but he's probably, I mean, he's buried, right? We haven't heard his name mentioned. Uh, haven't seen him really even running much with the twos. He's been mostly a threes guy at this yeah. point. So that is, that is frustrating. Brian Kelly said redshirting him is on the table. Like they're they're not going to they're not going to play him unless if they feel like he's ready and they'll then they'll take a richer. I mean, it's. I remember when he committed the recruiting guys. All our buzz was he might be your starting corner next year, yeah. or or maybe a starting safety. We'll see. And that just has not panned out at all. Man, um, you kind of answered my question. Like, you, do you not think it's a talent? You think it's a talent issue or a depth issue when it comes to the secondary? Because like, obviously, we're sitting here talking about like a Marshall transfer and Southeastern transfer and stuff. Do you think it's a talent issue where? You know, you need to go back into the portal again next year and try to add more experienced talent? Or do you think this 2024 class kind of, you know, has that talent coming into where they can make an immediate impact? So, no. So, I think that's that's a good question. And I, I'm i more interested. So, I understand, like, why they did what they had to do, right? Like, you had to get guys that at least played college football. So, you weren't just running out a bunch of freshmen. So, I get it. But the interesting thing, the difference this year from last year, is all the corners you recruited last year were going to be one and done. Like Jark Bernard Converse, Shane McKay Gardner, uh, Colby Richardson, all those guys were one and done. Like yeah, Joe, yeah. Yeah, uh, Joe, Joe Fouché, um, and he was a safety, but still. But, um, all the guys this year, Zai has another year. Chestnut has two more years. Right. Uh, J.K. Johnson from Ohio State. Who I mean, that, guys, that maybe that's an X factor too. Like I was going to bring him up. I wanted to see what you would say about that too. Now I haven't seen him. Right. So like he, I mean, he got hurt like the first or second day of camp. So I top fifty recruit. Like they, they're really high on him. Like long term wise. J.K. So Johnson, you're talking about. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm I was checking the yeah. time, making sure we're pacing right. No, like, you're good. <laughs> so yeah. So but but if J.K. Johnson gets healthy, like that could be an answer. But he's back next year. 
Uh, Denver Harris is, you know, just a sophomore. So, so all these guys, all these transfers are all back again next year. It, it, or they can be. They have the eligibility yeah. to be. Right. And then now you've had two recruiting classes behind them. So you've still got LaTerrence Welch. you got the guys you you signed this past year. And then, the, you know, like Toviano and Jeremiah Hughes, Stamps. And then the guys that you're going to sign. So you're, you're, you have your – your veteran core at the top line, and you that's basically given you a buffer to let these young guys get get bigger and better and develop and more talented. And hopefully next year, some of those young guys are ready to go win jobs. Um, and if not, then your veterans have beaten them out, and that's, that's a really good thing too. But I, that's just one of those things that's going to take time unless if you were able to go to the portal and get Fentrell Cy- Cypress from Virginia. Exactly. But he went to Florida State. So – um, I'm I'm not super pessimistic long term. I just don't know where the answer is right now, yeah. unless if unless if Denver Harris can accelerate his growth, unless if J.K. Johnson comes back healthy. Like I just don't know where the answer is on this roster right now. I agree yeah. with that. I mean, I'd love to see somebody like Ashton Stamps enter the fold and kind of you know make that next step. But I mean, do you think it's the type of thing where it's going to take a lot more time for him to develop, or do you just throw him into the fire and say do what you do and and, and try to grow as quickly as you can? At some point. You have to do it. <laughs> At some yeah. point, you have to look and go, could it be any worse? I, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm on the exact same page as you, to be honest. You know, like the the one, like the nearest example I can, I, I've brought up a couple times. In the in the 2017 opener, that was the BYU game that was supposed to be in Houston, got moved to New Orleans. Um, right before that game is when we found out about Christian Fulton's suspension. Right. So so Fulton was out, and then somebody else got hurt. I'm blanking on who it was. But Greedy Williams, who had redshirted in 16, like wasn't even good enough to get on the field. Like he redshirted, which nobody was redshirting then under less. Like mm-hmm. everybody was playing. Greedy had to go start the opener against BYU, got a pick like the first three weeks of the season, never gave up his job, had an All-American year. So sometimes there are dudes that are just gamers, like they they don't practice as well, but the lights come on and they play big. Yeah, and maybe Stamps is that. Maybe someone on this roster will step up and be that guy. But again, it's just at this point, it's I I would just be guessing. I feel like they're not even really giving Welch a chance. Like like you know I, I haven't seen too much from him, and you know you were, you were at the spring game. I'm pretty sure with us, huh? Maybe. And he kind of shined during the spring game. <laughs> I was not at the spring game. I know. Yet. I said it maybe, but you know, he, he broke out. <laughs> Thank you for the show. cover, but no. <laughs> he, he he balled out during the during the spring game, and everybody was really impressed. When you were looking at people who kind of like stole the show in that regard, it was it, it was really him. Like Caleb Jackson took over in the fall camp scrimmage, and you know, Terrence Welch took over in that spring game scrimmage, and mm. you know, after that, like I mean, it seems like he almost fell off a cliff once these other guys got healthy because Deuce was injured during spring. He didn't play, yeah. so he entered the fold come fall camp, and. You know, I, I just kind of was waiting to see if maybe they'd give LaTerrence Welch, you know, a, a piece of the a piece of the pie in that secondary, and they just haven't given him a chance at all. So, I, I don't know, but you're, I, I don't know. I don't think it's a depth issue. I'm, I certainly think it's a talent issue moving forward. But I, you got to find answers fast, and if it means throwing Ashton Stamps into the fire, then you, you might just have to do that. You know what I like about that situation is they they do have depth in the defensive backfield. There's a lot of guys who have the ability to come on and be that guy. And it's one of those things you play the odds, you know, okay, you're, you're starting quarterback. You got a 70% chance. He's good enough that, you know, uh, okay. You, you, you blew the next guy's got a 40% and then the, you know, so on. So forth. eventually one of them's going to hit. If you have enough guys, that's I'm a, I'm a, I pump depth a lot more than a lot of guys do because of that, because I just know, Sometimes you've got a major burns looked like coming into the season. He was going to be one of your best DBs and thus far he's struggling. So yeah. if you have three guys behind him who also have a chance to be good players, you're going to get a good player eventually. If he makes a round, um, the, the best news for LSU to me is, you know, you know what the best solution to fix this defensive backfield is let Jalen mill roll <laughs> roll out there and throw against you. Uh, I was going to say the rest of the quarterbacks in the league stink. Yeah, yeah, that's the good news for this defense. So they really don't have to be this just staunch unit. Uh, just bend, don't break. Be good enough. Don't blow anything wide open because the SEC, especially the West, is as winnable as it's ever been. I mean, I'm talking since 2007. I think um, – so I – 
completely agree. Um, and it was, again, one of the reasons I was bullish on this team. Um, I, um, I'm i trying to think if it, what, what in the West surprises me the most. Um, and and uh, is for y'all like is anything y'all have seen to this point like stood out the most? I mean, is it the Bama loss to Texas? Is it A and M continuing to to not live up to expectations? Like, what what in the West has surprised you so far? It has to be an A and M. I mean, I feel like at some point you have to take that next step. The recruiting class was so damn good. I mean, you have to figure at some point they're going to hit their stride. Not not with an eighty million dollar buyout. Like yeah, like you're, <laughs> no, you're not you see. <laughs> See here, I I disagree, guys. Like I think if he if they go eight and four, you think they do it? He's borderline seven and five, he's gone. I'll like I'll tell like whenever they whenever they hired Jimbo, and they gave him sort of infamously ten year seventy five, right? And the whole world melted. Uh, how could you pay him all this money? It's mm-hmm. and one of the things that I remember saying at the time was. By the time he gets to the end of that contract, he's going to be the thirtieth highest paid coach in the country because everybody's going to be made. Yeah. And now you're seeing it. I mean, just look at look at professional contracts, right? The market just keeps getting reset. But the other thing too was I had a buddy who was doing some work at Texas A and M and was in a meeting with the, with the chancellor there. Um, I probably shouldn't say that. Let's say with uh, someone who's high up in the administration. Yep. Um, and the guy kind of it was over the contract. The guy kind of laughed and was like we could cut that check a hundred times over and never blink. It's like, I don't think most people really understand just how much money A&M has. Like, I'm not saying that rich people are pumped about cutting a, an $80 million check to flush down the toilet. But it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Yeah. But I here's agree. but here's the other thing about A&M, and it's why I think Miami's fascinating, Texas is fascinating, why Colorado is fascinating, why Florida State is fascinating is because you have these tradition-rich programs. And you like you roll your eyes about Colorado, but Rashawn Salam won a Heisman in 94. They were co-national champs with Georgia Tech in 1990. Like, there are people there who remember what it's like to win. You know, Cordell Stewart, Michael Westbrook. I mean, they had good teams. Um, but I think you have these tradition-rich programs that are success-starved and they are willing to throw more money at NIL opportunities. Like it's it's harder. I'll put it this way: it's harder for LSU to fund its collective because man, we are fat and happy. Like we have watched this program succeed, and the athletic department succeed at such a high level. Imagine if you're Texas and you've been a punchline for 15 years, and you got all these dudes with oil money who are like, "What do you need? Oh, receiver, DB, D lot. Let's go." And same with Florida State. Florida State doesn't have more resources than LSU. They're just success starved. So when they wanted to go get, um, you know, Fentrell Cypress, when they wanted to go get Keon Coleman, when they wanted to go get Braden Fisk, LSU wanted all those dudes too. But Florida State was throwing the bag at them. They were willing to come harder. And by the way, that is not in any way a criticism. Like that's how that's that is how business is done now. And I, if if a kid can get his bag, God bless you. I'm not mad at anybody for that. No, me but but I think that's the biggest difference, guys. How different? How different does that LSU Florida State game look if Braden Fisk, Keon Coleman, Fentrell Cypress are wearing purple and gold? They dominated. They dominated the oh. transfer portal. It, it's what Norvell did. My thing with him though is like. How does he get this fresh talent so quickly? Or not even so quickly. How does he get this fresh talent and have them gel like that, like instantaneously? Yeah. Is it just yeah. they're just that talented and you could put them in any type of scheme and they're going to Kelly shine did or... it last year. Kelly yeah. did it last year, right? Yeah. Well, you say that, but Kelly, we there were growing pains with that team last year. Think about the Florida State team, just how discombobulated they look. Florida State don't look discombobulated at all. I guess the big difference there, that's a good point. But the big difference is you had Jordan Travis, who's a four-year starter right. at that school. <laughs> that was right. Was so, like, Jaden was uh, – guys, Jaden wasn't even the starter at the beginning of camp. Like, yeah, they were having – everybody wanted Miles Brennan to be the quarterback last year. And, and not to mention the coaching staff was all new last year, too. The coaches had never yeah. coached together because Polian was the only one who came off the plane with, with, with uh, 
uh, Kelly, right? And the rest of them hadn't. So you got coaches never coached together, players never played together, coming from all different walks of life. It was just a mess. Whereas with with Florida State, it's like, yo, dog, we've got a quarterback coming back, a bunch of receivers coming back. Why don't we just plug you into this spot? Oh, by the way, the quarterback's a stud. It can, can sling it anywhere you need it. You want to go up and get it? He, he's going to put it right on the dot for you. So it was more of a plug-and-play situation, whereas LSU was just – a gumbo of humanity last year putting it all together it was it was absolutely wild and impressive and fun to watch um we hit on nil and i think we are going through a shift in power in college football where nil is changing things um schools that have resources are putting things together whereas they wouldn't be able to in the past at the conference realignment and the expanded playoff i i think college football is going to look very different over the next 10 years and that's for sure that being said, I'm with you that LSU is still playing with everything. A lot of people have wrote this team off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I would have some concerns if LSU were playing in the playoff, right? Like I have some concerns if LSU rolls up to Georgia right now. I have concerns if they're playing USC. I have concerns if a lot of these teams they're playing nationally. But, you know, the SEC West this year, as shocking as this says, I, I like LSU's chances still, even with its flaws. I um, I could paint a scenario, but and again, I want to reiterate because I don't want some, I, I don't want someone to clip you know a, a ten second soundbite and have it be all encompassing. But so for context, I'm I'm not saying LSU is void of flaws. Clearly, they have them. Every team has them. I'm not saying there are, there aren't. Uh, booby traps on LSU schedule. Every game in the SEC. Look, especially. Going back-to-back road conference games, Ole Miss, Missouri, I don't care what school you're going to, going back-to-back road games in the conference is Brutal. very hard to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's always a possibility they could lose. But I like LSU. I would favor LSU in every game they play the rest of the season. That includes Alabama. How about that? As well. so, so you're taking LSU on the road straight up right now? Today I would because I don't think Jalen Milrow can lead that offense to score. Like LSU yeah. has a major Achilles heel. What team can exploit? Is Peyton Thorne and Auburn going to exploit that? Is now KJ Jefferson and and, and Arkansas could be a problem because they the got. One that the, I was going. That's the one that I was going to say, and that's really it. Like I, I agree. I agree. I mean, we just watched A and M go down to Miami and get bullied. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what? Where's where's the game that terrifies you? I, again, I'm not saying they're going to run the table and be 11 and one, and but I, I also don't see the game on the schedule where I go, oh, man, that's I don't know how they get past that one. You know, Tennessee last year was a problem. I think we all acknowledged that was a problem. Hooker was you know, that dude. Hook, Hendon Hooker was awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, you could look at Alabama and go, Bryce Young, God, no. and LSU won it, but. Mm-hmm. Man, like what Connor Connor Wigman? Is that maybe is that the guy? Be, uh, maybe beat you last year, man. Maybe Connor Wigman in that offense, Anaya Smith and all those receivers, Evan Stewart. Maybe they roll. I don't know. Maybe uh, not. Like I said, 10 and 2, 11 and 1 is very realistic. Still on the table. Not saying it it will for sure happen, because we all agree LSU has its flaws, but there's a lot they're still playing for. This this team this team's got some good stuff going on. Matt, I really appreciate you stopping in and taking some time to do the show tonight, man. It was great talking with you. Uh, appreciate you as always. Why don't you tell the people where one of one of the many places they could go check you out and keep oh, up bro. with your work? If you, I, Preston, what I always say is, if you can spell my name, you can find me. I'm, <laughs> I'm basically if you good luck with the vowels, but like if uh, yeah, I mean. So we're afternoons, ESPN stations throughout Louisiana and on our 104.5 ESPN YouTube channel for those that want to stream video. And then if I get like, you could find me on literally any social platform. I'm at Matt Moscona on, on every social media platform. There you go. Heard it from him yourself. Thank you for coming on, Matt. Have a great night. Appreciate My it, pleasure, guys. Thanks for the invite. Thank, Thank you. you. That was Matt Moscona of 104.5 ESPN. I got to get to a couple ads real quick. I appreciate everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, But don't go anywhere because if you're like me, sometimes when you're watching the defense, you have a little bit of trouble pinpointing exactly what was the issue, you know, because there's so many players involved in a broken play. You know, if a guy runs 34 yards, that takes like four or five guys. 
I charted the first three drives against Georgia. Uh, I'm sorry, Bill, I was about to say Georgia Southern uh, against Grambling. And I charted the good plays, the bad plays, all that. I got all that broken down. I'm going to give it to you in just a bit. But before we do that, we got to do celebrity theaters um, because they are our title sponsor this year. Remember, they are the Louisiana's only locally owned and operated theater with locations in Baton Rouge, Broussard, and Ruston. That's probably three of our biggest markets watching right now because they are locally owned they are guaranteed to have a clean facility better pricing superior customer service state-of-the-art technology and of course the baton rouge location has an invigorating arcade featuring over 50 games it is the largest in town has a bar featuring wine beer and frozen drinks over it's got oversized leather reclining seats, which are a must for me these days to go to a theater. And of course, the Dolby Atmos 3D sound system, which is incredible for those big movies you are going to. And of course, we also have to thank Alumni Hall. Hey, Tiger fans. You want to show your Tiger pride this year? Alumni Hall is your ultimate shopping experience. The best and largest selection of apparel for the whole family. Nike, Nike Golf, Champion, Columbia, Peter Millar, Southern Tide Hats, Yeti, Gifts and Accessories. LSU students, faculty, and military receive 10% off in-store every day. You can earn cash back with their Hall Pass rewards. Alumni Hall, located in Perkins Row or anytime at alumnihall.com. Alumni Hall, where Tiger fans shop guys appreciate y'all for listening with matt moscona uh he's a guy i connected with earlier this week after you know a, a little bit of a, a scuttle i'm not going to relive it but you know we both hilarious. talked on the phone you know it happens sometimes we both talked on the phone he was incredibly nice uh and we both agreed man we want something good to come of this and i think that was really good content we got tonight so looking forward to doing that was good yeah. stuff. looking forward to doing more good stuff with Matt Moscona in the future. Um, so we talked about the defensive struggle of Grambling. And, and Zach, tell me if I'm wrong, but if your one negative takeaway from the Grambling game is, it's how the defense struggled early, right? I mean, it has to be. To, to allow them to score so quickly on that first drive and, you know, target Denver Harris, what, one time on the first drive and it resulted in a touchdown. Yep. You circled the secondary and, and that was, you know, a challenge for the most part. Really getting to the quarterback too. I mean, you can sit here and talk about the secondary kind of all you want, but Chance Williams, Grambling's running back, he, he really cut up for the most part, man. Yeah. 106 yards on, what, less than 10 carries. So, yeah. you know, for him to, to put up such significant numbers was well, it was pretty impressive. So we can sit here and talk about the secondary all we want, but there, there's still some work to be done with that defensive line. You know, you get Mason Smith back, continuity has to form, and obviously that's going to become a strong suit for this team, you know, in the long term. But for now, you, you, need, you need to find some answers relatively quickly. But – yeah, secondary was a struggle. Defensive line hit their groove, but yeah, th- those are two things that you have to pinpoint from that from that Grambling game on Saturday. Last week we talked ad nauseum about Jaden Daniels and the offense and the struggles. Right, um, I'm not going to waste any time this week because they went ten for ten scoring on their first ten drives. They did not have to punt in the game, and the only time they didn't score was at the end of the game. Uh, guys, if you're watching this and you're enjoying the show tonight, please do me a favor, smash that like button, because I forgot to hit on that reminder. Mike Scarborough will make fun of me for forgetting to tell you to like the show. So please like the show so the algorithm gods can bid us uh, having done our job. Okay, like like this is good content. People hit the like button. Get it out there for us. And, guys, uh, there's a lot of comments tonight. Our final segment tonight is going to be getting to comments and talking with you. Um, in the meantime, if you got something you really want, just remember Super Chats are a great way to make sure you get what's on your mind out there, but not obligated. We're going to try to get to people uh, toward the back end of the show anyways. But I've got this big old chart of plays here. Um, in the first 26 plays, three drives, they had 230 two yards of offense on three drives that is grambling an fcs team so that should be very alarming 8.9 yards per play on 26 plays that's not getting it done what happened well of those plays i charted 12 bad plays and then 14 good plays so you know some mixture it's just 12 bad plays to grambling concerning what went wrong well (sighs) DBs not being able to find the ball, good coverage, but just couldn't find the ball. That happened three times. Bad tackling, allowing big plays to come come up. That happened four times. All four 
bad tackles, all four missed tackles, came from Major Burns, who is just coming from that safety position trying to annihilate someone, which is cool. Like kids grow up playing safety, wanting to do that. But the thing is, you got to teach them when and where to do it. Harold Perkins did it on the very first play of the game where he absolutely annihilated the running back. Great play. Um, Major Burns kept on trying to do it after they had the ball in their hands. And, of course, after you have the ball, you can take one step. If a guy's coming full speed, he's not changing his direction. So you need to learn to break down. Don't do the sexy thing. Just chop your feet and get them on the ground, okay? Scheme was – so So Madhouse played corners and DBs really off the ball a bunch, 10 yards off, right? And whether it's good or bad to do that, I'm not commenting on because, A, I don't have the defensive plays. I'm just trying my best, uh, and I'm not in his head and explaining it, and Matt House is way smarter than me. But I will tell you that because the corners uh, or, or DBs were playing 10-plus yards off the ball, they did take advantage of that on a few throws and were able to get first downs. That happened three times they exploited the zone for the yeah they did a super yeah. big way on that it was a soft drive. zone yeah that that was what absolutely just destroyed by the way early. defensive line pass rush was re- was as good as you could expect every single pass i charted less than two seconds mm-hmm. they knew what they were they knew their offensive line couldn't block them now defensive line i don't think is a talent issue they had some issues it's a discipline issue and getting okay. reps under their belt too, you know, yeah. right, with, with Smith back and stuff. In-game reps is going to be key for them. But, yeah, I completely agree with you. And Makai Wingo made some mistakes too where he ran too far. Up. It's very tempting as a defensive lineman to just run upfield and smack the quarterback. The reality is if you get a soft block or unblocked, you need to square your shoulders to the line of scrimmage, push in, and be ready for them to come to you because the odds are they're hoping you take yourself out of the play and then they give themselves numbers downfield for a big play. Right, so you got to play discipline. I attribute that to straight up to Jimmy Lindsay missing time, Jack Janik shuffling in. I'm not blaming Jack Janik by the. Or I'm sorry, it's John ja- John Janik. I'm sorry, I'm not blaming him, but it is tough to come in as an interim and you know take players who are coming off an of injury and get reacclimated into a new position. It's not ideal. I definitely think that that is uh, part of the problem here. Um, so, so defensive line pressure on pass plays was great. It was their discipline on running plays, which really, really hurt. Uh, as far as individual grades, uh, Savion Jones was a guy a lot of people were asking if he was disappointing. No, I mean, and, and bear in mind, guys, plays where it doesn't go to him or he's just indifferent, I'm not charting. He Three times he showed up, he had a great play, two good plays. Harold Perkins, great play on the first play of the game. Then he had three bad plays on those first drive and one, two, three, four. So five good or great plays, three bad plays on Perkins. Zy Alexander had a few plays where he was bad. He was bad on three plays and good or great on, on three as well. Greg Penn had a pretty good first three drives uh, with one bad play he had. um, And the rest were good. Three good, good or great plays. Mason Smith, two good, too bad. One play where he absolutely blows it up in the backfield and forces the running back outside. And then we talked about his his discipline on, on running. Omar Spates. Omar Spates was really bad, guys, in the first three drives. And I hate to see this, but he does he first off, he's getting he's not getting off his blocks, right? He should be taking advantage and reading the situation and blowing up a block. Instead, he, these guys are making it to the second level. And part of that's on the aforementioned Mason Smith issues. But second off, he's not able – like the guys are running past him. He's, he he's not injured. Sure. I don't know if something was wrong maybe before the game or – He looks slow. During the game, but, you know, he come the second half, he was in street clothes. And then Kelly listed him as probable today. So I don't know if maybe he, he was shaken up or something. But he looked a step slow on, uh, on Saturday for sure. Um, Andre Sam had uh, two times he showed up on the first few drives, two bad plays. One was really bad where he stepped up on a counter tray um, and was in position to make the tackle, but the running back makes one little cut. And boom, he's outside off to the races, and it's like a 34-yard gain. I want to give so, credit to Chance Williams, though, too, man. He 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 did his he, he looked he great. Thing. You know, he he, he, he looked did great. his thing, but this is an FCS team, and you're you're expected yeah. to not let them, even with playing over the fire under them, 
You're expected to take care of them. Major Barnes, four bad plays. I already talked to him. Four bad tackles. Major Burns, make a tackle. Last week, it was his coverage getting beat over the top. Today, last night, it was bad tackles. Wingo, Makai Wingo, who's been the unheralded hero of this defense, and a lot of people have been singing his praise this year. Two good plays, one great play, two bad plays. He did make mistakes where he went too far upfield, and they they made big runs off of it. Um Denver Harris, of course, had two bad plays in coverage. Um, and then he had one good play where he should have had an interception. He got two hands on the ball. Mm-hmm. Could have shut the drive out with no points. Instead, he drops it. And it was actually a weird jump ball situation where multiple Andre Sam got his hands on it. And then eventually the Grambling player catches it out of bounds. But at the same time, it's a PBU. Good play on his part. And then he got beat in the end zone. The play he got beat in the end zone is... Just didn't turn his head. It's encouraging to me mm. because he was in tight coverage. Yeah. And it was a bad throw by uh, the quarter. It's very arguable that Denver Harris was some time and discipline could have had two interceptions on those first two drives because he was in position to make them both times. Mm-hmm. Uh, Braden Swinson did not have a good half. Twice he got he got shut down on the backside on a, on a run. Like they, they ran a counter to one side and then they came back and he was – crashed inside and they just ran outside of him. He did not do good with outside contain. So that is my overall breakdown. I of course have every play where I have notes on it. So if y'all want to ask about a specific play, go for it. But I feel like that's, that's kind of the deal. So, so, so going through these plays, Zach, um, the DBs are probably going to be what the DBs are. There's probably going to be some, some growing pains. What, what outside of them is most concerning and, and do you see it getting fixed up? Defensively, like I was saying a minute ago, it's just getting some in-game reps under your belt with Mason Smith back in the fold. You know, it wasn't that impressive of a showing for for them. Really, we can sit back here and, and kind of say, you know, the getting to the quarterback was great. The quarterback got their passes off within two seconds. All that is fantastic on paper, but all in all, allowing that that group to, you know, like we said, cut up on those first couple of drives is something that just should have never happened. LSU should have been shot out of a cannon. And, just with Mason Smith back, it, there should have been no offensive production from that unit whatsoever. So to me, sure, the secondary is going to be a problem, but I really need to see this defensive line group get into a groove very soon, you know, because you're looking at a Mississippi State unit who's running the ball pretty effectively right now to a degree. So you just need Mason Smith to get back in shape again, and it's going to take some time, gel with Makai Wingo, have Savion Jones do his thing as well, and then Ovio Gufo on the other side. You, you need these front four guys to handle business, and I really think they can because – Mason Smith, he, he just hasn't played. Talent in a year. is there. The talent is. He just hasn't played in a year. So talent. He, They're playing around their defensive line. Yeah, and he hasn't point. played since, what, September 4th, 2022. So just get a game under your belt. He had 35 plus snaps under his belt. So let this defensive line gel. And I think that's going to be a strong suit for you. And it's in turn going to take some pressure off that secondary come SEC play. All right, guys, last sponsorship of the night spot. we got to get to Celebrity Theaters here. Of course, they have their weekly promotions there. Make sure to go check them out in their Baton Rouge, Rustin, and Broussard locations. Monday night is Senior Savings Day where you save $5 for all patrons over the age of 55. Tuesday, Bargain Tuesday, discounted movie tickets and concessions for all. Wednesday, College Night, admission for college students is uh, $5 after 5 p.m. And, of course, the Baton Rouge location has half-off arcades all day. Thursday in the Baton Rouge location is Thirsty Thursday, which is your discounted um, uh, alcoholic beverage, your discounted bar items, which, again, living in the future, guys. Uh, remember, all celebrity theater locations house 8 to 10 auditoriums. So whether you're interested in hosting a birthday party, private movie screenings, corporate meeting, or an arcade party, we have all the perfect facilities to fit your needs. Celebrity Theaters is proud to offer birthday packages for all children of all ages. Let us handle everything from movies to entertainment to set up to clean up. For more information or to book your party online, visit www.celebritytheaters.com backslash events or give them an email at events at celebritytheaters.com. Our show is also brought to you tonight by Spectre Sports Art. You can see the special seven painting behind me. That's one of his newer pieces where we celebrate Dylan Cruz and his championship with the baseball team. But remember, we've also got the twenty two the 2019 Smoking Joe special, which is one of the coolest and most sold pieces of art. Um, 
And of course, we've got his perfection piece with Coach O and Joe Burrow. I don't know if y'all saw today. Coach O tweeted out a story about sacking his own son eight times in Tiger Stadium, which was really cool when McNeese came in 2021. Really cool moment. I'm glad Coach O is going down favorable. Like like fans have a favorable impression of him uh, moving forward. So um, maybe that's a good piece. All these pieces just have incredible attention to detail from the puzzle piece on his wristband to the memories and the championship trophy to Joe Burrow's cigar with the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the message, you can't do it. You're not good enough. It really just tells the story of those special season. Um, and again, best part, Joe Burrow's family has that picture hanging in their living room. Dylan Cruz family has it hanging in their room uh, back behind there. You can go to the website. The link is in the description of this video, or you can go to spectersportsart.com and look for the Bayou collection and you'll see all the good stuff. They've got Drew Brees, the Saint. They have the Tiger Stadium picture behind me. Uh, and of course, he just came out with a Tommy Tanks special, which I'm hoping to get soon. So make sure to go check out that stuff. Use the promo code TigerBait10 for 10% off your first set order. Guys, you will not be disappointed with this collection. All right, we're going to get to some comments here, and we're going to roll on out in a few more minutes. Let's see here. Uh, if Mason Smith needs to get ready, what makes people think he was going to make a difference against FSU? Well, he was still a very talented player and yeah, he's rusty, but um, he, he's still freaking nature, right? I mean, that, that, having him in your lineup helps, right, Zach? Yeah, without a doubt. And I mean, it also takes pressure off Makai Wingo because Makai was really thrown into a fire there of having to do absolutely everything for that defensive line. And sure, he came through and his numbers were incredible. And you can take PFF, you know, their analysis with a grain of salt, but his numbers were exceptional. He was a top graded defender, but you put somebody like Mason Smith next to him as well, and that's a, yeah. a dynamic duo. And it also gives him a, a major contest under his belt. So, you know, Grambling is kind of a tune-up game, but Florida State, is that, that's the one where he would get absolutely back into a rhythm. So, yeah, it, it would have it would have taken time for him to get effective, but having somebody of his presence on the field is massive. So, that, Which, if you massive. listen to my breakdown, by the way, uh, the pass rush on every play was great. Uh, there were some plays where Mason Smith was just unblockable. It's just they got the ball out in a second. You can't get from line of scrimmage to quarterback in one second. Um, also, you know, he had two good plays and two bad plays. The reason why we're saying the fact that he's rusty and he's still playing that as well as he did is impressive. He is he's you know oozing talent. We just need to get some a little bit of uh, better discipline going, and I think he will make uh, this team going. Look, Dane Bergeron, great best comment of the night. <laughs> we need bigger, more big cat grills. This team needs to get tough. Are you saying? Are you saying we need dudes ready to throw hands? I was about to someone... say you just said you, we just did this. Like you literally put out how there's just no fight, no dog. You're saying that you said that last. Are week. you saying we need someone with that dog in them? Mm -hmm. You're damn right we do, um, especially uh, offensive line and defensively. Now, Harold Perkins showed a little bit of that swagger, that that nastiness in, in his jack outside linebacker. But tackling is – I mean, they got to work on tackling big time. I know this is the day and age of keeping your, your players healthy and, and whatnot, but they – look, you got to work on tackling. I mean, your defense cannot operate if you cannot put a guy on the ground. Um, Mac Daddy, what's the deal with Daniels and neighbors? Is, Zach, are you aware of a deal with them? I can't think of a deal at all besides, you know, Brian Thomas kind of being the go-to guy for these first two weeks. I mean, BT's really been exceptional for the first two weeks so far, and I was kind of talking to Matt Bruni about that the other day. But, you know, there, there's no disconnect between Daniels and neighbors. I think people are just honing in on him and, you know, double-teaming him, putting big-time coverage on him, and it's freeing up Brian Thomas. But – Come SEC play, you're, you're, you're going to see you're, you're going to see Malik Neighbors hit his stride. They doing Perkins wrong. Let that man. I'm gonna say this. They they he he was more all over the field than I thought. Of the graded players, okay, that I had, he was he had the most plays. And by the way, most positive plays too. But he did have three bad plays. One was a coverage play where he couldn't find the ball. Um, but great play on the very beginning. Good, good, great, and another good. Okay. 
he he uh, and this is only on the three drives where they struggled. I mean, he was the bright spot of that defense. They are trying to get him after the quarterback more. Um, he didn't get any sacks because Gra- I understand Grambling's coached by a former NFL head coach, Hugh Jackson. Now he was three and thirty six with the Browns, but that's not your the typical pedigree of the FCS coach. Uh, is a guy who was an NFL head coach. He knew. He knew he had to get the ball that quickly. They didn't have a single pass that took more than two seconds. That was by design. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, I, I think that they're 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 doing that. I think in situations where the team will have to pass and her Perkins has to play, I, I think he will go back to, to more of what we were seeing last year. I also like that they're not just giving up on him playing a true linebacker and just making him a a pass rushing pony. Uh, I'm glad that they are using him in coverage and and run stopping. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> Why did we have a DC in MC? The, the marketing girl was very different. Um, Carl the cat. First off, great loyal listener to the show. Carl's a high school referee. Great guy. Uh, appreciate you commenting. Uh, Carl, the best I can tell you is over the years, the Tiger Stadium music DJ has been highly criticized. I mean, highly criticized over the years, and they just did something to change it. But I haven't talked to any. What did you think about the music? I, I I didn't think it was too terrible. Yeah, no, I, I have no comment on that at all. But I did see somebody talking about that the other day. Maybe it's a generational thing because I was sitting there bopping my head with some of the stuff. Like, you know, you put some Eminem on and, you know, and some Boosie mm-hmm. on. Like, my, my playing days come out. I'm like, oh, yeah. My, that dog starts to come out in me, believe it or not. Um, But, uh, then I look right next to me and Mark Scarborough is looking at me like, dude, where's the ACDC at, man? I wish they'd put on the Eagles. This is, this is, ugh. So maybe, maybe it's a generational thing, but I don't know. But they're trying to do some things to spice it up. Well, guys, I appreciate y'all for joining us on the show tonight. Uh, I think it was a pretty good show tonight. I appreciate Matt for stopping by. That was a, 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 a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, please, guys, if you enjoyed the show tonight, hit that like button, share the show, do the good stuff. Make sure you get subscribed. We are growing fast. We're quickly rolling on our way to 25,000 subscribers. I'm really hoping to get that this football season so we can have a little celebration for that. Um, but y'all make sure to like the show. So, I can keep my job and Mike Scarborough doesn't make fun of me for not having enough likes and all that good stuff. Cause I believe there are a lot of people liking the show. Zach appreciate you as always for joining us and y'all have a great night.